Thank you, Chris. Finding tech talent is hard, and, and retaining people is hard too. While it's important to, to get people from outside to find external talent, it's indispensable to, to have a clear internal path for advancement as well. And there's lots of reasons for this. It motivates individuals to invest more of their career at a company. It locks in all that juicy domain knowledge. It's just generally good for everyone. So, so this talk is about how to grow tech leads, both from the point of view of an aspiring senior developer and a mentor wishing to grow them. And these two points of view are not as different as they seem, because there are many things in common uh, in how a, uh, uh, a tech lead might wish to grow a senior developer and how a more senior mentor might wish to grow a tech lead. So we'll shine a light from above and a line from below, uh, and perhaps we will illuminate the topic. There are gaps between what makes a senior developer effective and a tech lead effective. And while there's always more to learn, generally these gaps tend to be non-technical. We can assume that someone in this position is already very, very good technically. And it's usually things like projecting influence appropriately, understanding the social dynamics at a company, learning about the broader company context. Now, some people seem to be naturals at this. But for most of us, it's a learnt skill. And this can be underappreciated. It's not, you know, I'm a people person. I, I'm not a people person. People skills are fundamentally learnable, just like programming. But, but unlike programming, where there's this seemingly infinite wealth of resources on how to learn it and how to get across it, most programmers seem to learn people skills the same way that most managers do, which is by sucking at it for 10 years first. So how do you bridge the gap? And how do we help others bridge the gap? Looking at the perspective that different people have, different parts in their, their technical career, a developer will usually, their perspective will usually be very team focused, focused around the responsibilities and activities of the team and the relationships with the team members. A senior developer might have a, a bit more of a connection to, to the broader company context. A tech lead will often have a much broader view, again, perhaps spanning several teams, but they'll start to lose a bit of depth. And then the higher you go, you get different shapes and different breadths and different depths and that sort of thing. So part of the challenge here is to help shift a senior developer's perspective into uh, something that is better connected to the broader company context. Now, a manager can make a big difference here. Because a manager's job, even a manager of just a single team, is fundamentally much more connected to what the company is doing in the broader context. They're not focused on the code that's being written, they're focused on the team working as a machine, on fixing the social dynamics, making it work fluidly, making it fit in with the broader company. These are all things that are useful for developers to know about as well, if they wish to develop that part of their career. So by being transparent, managers can help you by being transparent about their goals, the processes, decisions, motivations, and rationales, they can help interested developers learn this kind of thing passively. Not everyone's interested, and that's fine, but, but this can help. Building trust is the secret source to getting anything done in an organization of any size. If people trust you, it's a force multiplier. And if people don't trust you, then the walls start to close in. And all you can do is what you can do with your own two hands. You can't work with people, you can't work through people. Now, someone on the cusp of being a tech lead usually has a lot of trust and respect built up with the people they work with. And often, technical excellence alone is enough to build these trust relationships. But moving up into more of a tech lead kind of role, you need to build trust with a whole bunch of extra people, this whole extra cast of people, and technical excellence alone is usually not enough to build up that trust. You need to build new skills to do that. So this could include managers, product managers, uh, BAs, designers, customers. Now here's an illustration of the difference that trust can make. So here's a conversation with a strong trust boundary between the two people. Alice has some news to give to the product manager. Now the product manager trusts Alice. They, they trust that Alice cares about what they're trying to do. They trust that Alice wants to help them get the product in front of customers. And so the mental framing they go in here is, I, I think Alice wants to help me. I know she does. Uh, knowing how the tech fits in will help us we'll get there sooner. Alice has bad news. The spaceship is actually going to take 10 years. 
But if we cut some corners, we drop the space lasers, and uh, you know, we just deliver a quadcopter, we can get it done in a month. Now, because of this trust boundary, the product manager can take that at face value and say, well, look, that's a shame, but we'll go for the quick win and we can iterate from there. A better decision was arrived at because not only did Alice have good advice, but a trust bond had been formed that enabled the product manager to take that at face value. Now, it all goes a bit differently where there isn't trust. So this time, before Alice even opens her mouth, this is the framing that the product manager takes into it. Well, let me guess. Alice can't deliver on time because of some techie blah, blah, blah thing. If she loved customers half as much as she loved her fancy, shiny tech things, we'd have delivered by now. Now, how do you think they're going to see what she says now? So she says the same thing. You know, spaceship's going to take 10 years, yada, yada, yada. Now, this time, the response looks a bit different. Did you try this? Did you try that? We really need spaceships. I'm going to need you and the team to really dig deep and just focus and believe. Now, this is a totally obnoxious and dismissive thing to say, uh, but uh, it, the course of this conversation has effectively been predetermined because that product manager doesn't take what she's saying at face value because there isn't that trust relationship. And for argument's sake, this product manager might be completely living in fantasy land. It, this spaceship plan may be completely unfeasible, but it doesn't matter. Now, now fortunately, this is all in Alice's control. Had she taken that time beforehand to build up that trust relationship with the product manager, it all would have gone a bit better. So this is the difference that it makes. Now, I'm very proud to present a Yale 2019 exclusive. Here is the secret to building trust and advancing your career. You ready? Don't be terrible. Ta-da! Not even joking. Wish I was joking. This is the thing that separates the 90% from the, the 10%. Not intelligence, not hard work. Don't even have to be good at your job. Just don't be terrible. Don't believe me? Let's have a look at some examples. So here's one, uh, a simple example. Bilal promises the boss, I'm going to write up the notes from this meeting. Boss says, no worries. He doesn't do it. That's terrible. <laughs> now, it didn't take a whole lot of technical genius for Bilal to write up those notes. It didn't take a whole lot of emotional and social skills. It took five minutes of time and a moderate amount of non-terribleness. Now, at this point, Bilal's going to protest. Seriously, come on. It doesn't matter that much. I've got important things to do. No, no one reads these stupid notes anyway. I mean, it doesn't matter that much, right? Well, here's the thing. So this is what your boss's calendar looks like. Here's a lot of stuff on it. Being a manager is a demanding job. It's a very dynamic job. There's a lot of things that are dynamically shifting and changing in real time. They have to juggle a lot of things in their head. Um, if Bilal has not built that trust relationship with, with his boss, and he can't be relied upon to complete tasks, every single time he opens up his mouth, this is what happens to that calendar. Another five things go on it. The boss makes a mental note. Well, I better check up on Monday. Hey, Bilal, how are you going with that note thing? Tuesday, hey, did you get onto that note thing yet? Wednesday, and so on and so forth. Uh, this, <laughs> you can imagine how a busy person appreciates this extra imposition. Now imagine if that manager is managing six reports and all of them are like this. What does that do to the calendar? A and how much is that boss going to get done that week? Maybe not very much. So this is an insight. Being terrible in this way doesn't just it, it, uh, affect you as an individual, it also makes people around you worse. The boss is effectively worse at their job because Bilal and, and possibly his teammates uh, are terrible. Now, uh, I, I must ask you at this point, dear audience members, to consider whether you can remember a time recently where your boss has checked in on you. Well, hey, buddy, how's it going with that thing? Perhaps, let's say, two or more times in a week. Because if so, I, I, I must inform you that you are terrible. <laughs> it has to be true. Because if you were in the habit of proactively informing your boss that, that you know, the state of the thing that you're working on, they wouldn't come up and check on you, would they? No, well, what would be the point? If they trusted that because you have committed to completing something, uh, and therefore it's as good as done, they wouldn't come up and check on you, would they? So, so this is 
the fact that they've come to up and checked on you uh, a, a number of times in a week is in fact direct, personal, and irrefutable feedback that, that you are terrible. Fortunately, it's also very valuable feedback, and it's really, really easy to change. The bar is really low. You can go back to work after this conference and just start not being terrible just like this, just by realizing it. So that's good news. Uh, now, uh, Bilal is not terrible. Bilal now has established a pattern of being reliable and of being dependable. And uh, now, this is what happens to the boss's calendar. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff that's missing, a whole bunch of stuff that the boss doesn't need to think about because it's sorted. Because Bilal said, I'm going to do this, I'll handle it. It is sorted. There is less that that boss even needs to think about. And they can start plowing that time into proactive things, looking forward to, to the strategy in the, the coming months or, or year or, or something. And so, again, uh, building trust with the people around you not only makes you better, it also makes the people around you better. Now, uh, when an opportunity opens up for a promotion, who's going to get it? Well, I'll get it. Is it because he's a genius? Is it because he's a 10 times programmer? Well, well, maybe he is, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. He's getting that because he's the person in his team that's not terrible. Here's another one. Carla has been working on a hard problem for a few weeks, but she's a bit stuck. And uh, boss checks in, nah, 80% done, she'll be right. Time passes, time's up, boss checks again. And well, it turns out she's actually been stuck for some time and didn't tell anybody. That's terrible. Carla, Carla didn't communicate the state of her work effectively and now everyone is behind. Now Carla's gonna protest at this point. You can't be serious, it's done when it's done. I don't know what I don't know. Well, here's the thing, Carla. What you know is that you don't know what you don't know. And what you know you should tell your boss is that you know you don't know what you don't know. So <laughs> where I'm going with that point is uncertainty is itself a salient bit of information that's important to communicate because it helps people act on that basis. Things can proceed. So, so for argument's sake, her, her calendar might have started on Monday. Working, 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 gets stuck on Friday, muddles through the whole next week and a half, and finally it comes to a head. And now experts have got to be roped in, a domain expert and a tech expert, and they had to completely drop what they were doing. So some other project on the other side of the company is now falling behind because all those people had to just throw all the, the things out of their head and, and rush over with their hair on fire to help out. And maybe that gets it over the line. Um, but again, the bosses filled up their head with checking up on Carla activities, and uh, it hasn't been very helpful over, overall. Uh, one thing to think about is that your boss also has a boss. And the conversation that your boss has with their boss tend to look a little bit different. <laughs> there's, there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> and if your boss gets in that room uh, with the Monopoly money bags person here um, and can't answer straight questions with straight answers, because you or your teammates haven't been uh, upfront and straightforward about the, the difficulties that you're facing, then you can get your boss roasted like a turkey in a boardroom. And that's not fun for anybody. No one likes that. Uh, <laughs> again, we see this pattern. Building trust relationships not just makes you better, it makes everyone else better. And not doing that makes everyone else worse as well. Now, Carla's not terrible. This time, uh, she gets stuck. Uh, and this time she directly communicates that. Look, I was having some trouble, uh, I'm having some trouble now, can't get it done, uh, just thought I'd let you know. And that's great, because now the boss has options. There are things that can be done. Maybe they can delay that work and reschedule it later, and they can go on with something more valuable right now. Maybe they can get other people in to help out in such a way that doesn't interrupt everyone else and, and cause these great panics with hair on fire and all sorts of things. And this builds a stronger trust relationship between Carla and the boss. Now, inexperienced or insecure programmers will sort of feel like this is a sign of weakness. So if I admit that I, I'm struggling on a task and I can't get the job done, people will think less of me. But really, the opposite is true. People who know what they're talking about, people who know what they're doing, understand that this reflects really, really well on an individual that speaks up 
uh, and says this. Nobody knows all the answers. Nobody is expected to know all the answers. But uh, it's an important form of trust, to be able to trust that someone will speak up when, when they're stuck. So, again, uh, this didn't require any great intelligence on Carla's part. It didn't require her to be a fantastic programmer. She didn't need great social skills or anything else. She just needed to be not terrible. That was all that was required. It's not all about bosses and promotions and this sort of thing. It's also about, uh, it works like this with really anybody that you work with. So, so here a colleague is coming to Dave uh, because they, they think that Dave can perhaps help them out with something. Dave says, yeah, no worries, weeks pass, and colleague comes back, they were really depending on Dave to get some stuff done, and he, he didn't. Uh, lol, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> um, now Dave will protest, look, I'm, I'm really busy, like sometimes things drop on the floor, it's, it's really their problem, it's not my problem. Well, here's the thing. So the colleague is trying to achieve some goal, and they're looking at Dave as, as a potential means of uh, achieving that goal. Now, by being so eminently unhelpful and, and unproductive, Dave is presenting himself as an obstacle in that network. He's damaged in the network. And they might just sit there and get stuck for some length of time, but it's more likely that they'll try and route around him and go through some unproductive, indirect route of asking various people around the company to get to their goal. Uh, and this means that they don't trust Dave. They're less likely to go to Dave to, to achieve something they want to achieve. Um, they're less likely to listen to Dave when he has opinions about how things should go. Now, here's Not Terrible Dave. Now, Dave, Not Terrible Dave doesn't necessarily know all the answers. He might know the answer. He might go, oh, oh sure there, colleague, here you go. Uh, just do that, and you're, and you're right. But it's more likely that, you know, and especially in a big company, that he might not know. He might say, look, I'm really busy, I can't help you right now, but, but I can set aside an hour later in the week. That's helpful. He might say, look, I, I actually don't know the answer at all, but I, I know you can go talk to these people uh, over here, that, that they're probably going to help. That's helpful too. That helps the colleague achieve their goal. It might be, well, look, I don't have the answer on the top of my head, but there's some resources over here that you can read to help you understand this. That's also really helpful. So all of these things demonstrate to the colleague that Dave cares about them achieving their goal as well as him achieving his own goals. And none of them necessarily involve Dave just taking on some arbitrary amount of work and, and being constantly interrupted. So these also you know, include options that really allow Dave to protect his own uh, work that he's doing. But, but all of them uh, build up trust with the colleague. And they'll come back to him next time. They'll think, oh, Dave was helpful. I'll come back there. Uh, and this is what happens over time. Because other people discover that they can get to where, what they want to achieve by talking to Dave. Now, you know what that is? That's power. Dave is now somebody of account, somebody whose opinions must be consulted, someone who has the potential to influence the way things are done at the company. And it's all been built up through building trust with all these different people. Now, this isn't just fabulous for Dave's career, it's also fabulous for every single one of these other people that Dave is helping with his work. So trust, building up these trust relationships is not only making Dave better, it's making everyone else better too. And he didn't even have to be good at programming. He just had to not be terrible. So <laughs> as a mentor, uh, helping people develop the skills to build trust with, with other, um, especially non-technical people, is really important. And the major part of that, in my opinion, is helping them to not be terrible. Don't be terrible needs fixing in a shockingly high number of people. Uh, I'd estimate 90% of people. Um, and it's not that they're terrible people, really. It's not that they're bad. It's not that they lack talent. Mostly it's just a lack of self-awareness. Mostly all you need to do is just tell someone, hey, uh, you realize that's terrible? And they won't do it anymore. The, the bar is shockingly low. Uh, it's just that pe people don't realize it's there and they keep walking into it. So this is actually really, really easy to fix as a mentor if you can perceive this kind of behavior. You can help inform people and that way they don't have to figure it out themselves after uh, 10 years of being terrible. 
Now, um, well, one of the, the root causes of some of the, the closed, uncommun uncommunicative behavior that we saw earlier there is, is insecurity. Now, personal insecurities are absolutely rife at every point in a programming career. They are very, very, very common. Not everyone experiences it to the same degree, and not everyone handles it in the same way. But uh, it's completely natural. It's not something to be ashamed about. I, I, th I think everyone feels different kinds of insecurities at different points in their career. So uh, it's important to po point out, it, it does not in any way indicate a lack of talent. Um, some very talented people uh, are notoriously insecure and, and they use that as a, a spur to improve themselves in, in different ways. It also doesn't in, in any way indicate a lack of leadership potential, but it must be handled constructively because insecurities can uh, leak out into harmful and destructive behaviours if, if not handled well. Uh, and the consequences of these harmful and destructive behaviours are exacerbated by senior seniority. So as people get more and more senior, as they especially you know, go into tech lead positions, for instance, the amount of harm they can do is, is much greater. So as a mentor, uh, it's really important to be aware of this and to help uh, people manage their insecurities in, in a productive way. Now, now, one of the funny things about this is that junior developers seem to have a really, really great culture around this. They will talk openly about imposter syndrome, which is something that they frequently f feel. That there's just this really open conversation about how they feel about this and how they're trying to overcome it. You'll often see junior developers speak at conferences about imposter syndrome, which ironically doesn't sound very insecure at all if they're being so open about it. It's, it's actually really good. How, however, this sort of openness around insecurities dries up very quickly. Uh, so as soon as, almost as soon as someone is out of the junior gate, um, this kind of thing just completely dries up because programmers beyond that point do not want to admit weakness. They do not want to admit that they're in inside, they're feeling like they're not good enough. They're afraid of what others might think. They're afraid of losing prestige. A and this gets more and more marked and, and severe the more senior one becomes. Um, the more senior they, they become, people don't want to discuss these sort of things. So uh, let's explore that. Here's one. I, I feel like I'm, I'm not good enough, therefore I, I'm not even going to put up my hand in the first place. This is a lack of confidence uh, that, that is extremely common. Uh, and it could result from any one of a number of environmental causes. It could be th their upbringing, it could be that they're naturally introverted, it could be their life experience, it could be that they're from an underrepresented group in tech, and the very atmosphere that they breathe feels hostile and, and unwelcoming. Companies miss out on a huge amount of tech talent this way. So it's not only uh, denies these individuals opportunities that they deserve, it also means that, that the companies that they, they work at are missing out on a whole lot of talent and they're only going to promote the noisy people. So how, how, how do we change this? As a mentor, there, there are certain things you can do personally. You can help uh, reassure individuals and help try and um, uh, give them confidence to speak out and, and, and this kind of thing. But really, the only real solution for this one has to be systemic. It has to be, there has to be a culture of personal safety, and this is something you'll hear over and over again at this conference. A lot of the speakers here have talked about personal safety because it's that important. The, the cost of speaking out has to be reduced. Um, it's important for mentors to understand the effects that, that social privilege can have and, and act to, to counteract them. Now, this has to be proactive because the people in this position, the people that don't have the confidence to speak out, they will not complain about this. They will uh, maybe feel resentful, they will sort of button it up, uh, and eventually they will leave. And they probably won't complain. Now, uh, further to that, they won't necessarily complain even if you prompt them. Because they're in a position here where they don't feel safe to speak up. Are they going to feel safe just because you're directly asking them? Well, not necessarily. You are not entitled to honest feedback from people you prompt for honest feedback. Just because you ask for honest feedback doesn't mean you're going to get it. You have to earn it. And so the only sure thing to do here is to proactively try and set up this environment of, of pervasive cultural safety, personal safety, uh, and um, reducing the cost of speaking up.
Here's another one. I'm not actually good enough, therefore I will massively overcompensate by any means. This is a very common one as well. Uh, and uh, who, who's seen something like this in their workplace? <laughs> yeah, almost everyone, right? <laughs> um, this can be extremely harmful. Um, it can very swiftly devolve into a toxic team dynamic and, and hurt teams. People don't feel safe. People close up. They won't talk to each other. Shields go up. Uh, worse, juniors will emulate the behavior. Junior people will naturally emulate senior people, but unfortunately, technical excellence is really, really hard to emulate, but uh, being obnoxious is really, really easy to emulate, so guess what happens there? The, the people who are naturally uh, inclined to emulate these people will emulate the bad bits, and it will go round and round in circles, and things are gonna get bad really quickly. So uh, it's really, really important for mentors to nip this in the bud. This requires immediate one-on-one -on -one feedback, uh, immediate advice to tone it down, to increase the self-awareness of the people here. Now, it's important to understand that our, our obnoxious wannabe tech lead is not necessarily a bad person. And they're not necessarily a bad leader either, although it may be that they, they, uh, their, their responsibilities are premature at this point. It might be just that they just feel like they're not good enough uh, and they've got this, this reaction that they need to overcompensate and they just need to be made aware that that's just not a good way to handle it. So, yes, it's important for a, a mentor to, to do this, but this requires a very, very, very strong trust bond between the mentor and, and that wannabe tech lead. Because if there isn't a really strong trust bond there, uh, a, a very defensive reaction is likely, the shields will go up, and from that point it's very difficult to come back. So trust, building these trust bonds is not just important for our people who want to grow themselves into tech leads, it's also important for the people trying to mentor them. Here's another one. I'm not actually good enough, therefore I must be as defensively opaque as possible so people don't ask me questions. <laughs> this one is sort of common as well, I think. And so the aim here, that they discover that they can sort of make themselves a small target and you know, I don't want people to ask me questions because then they'll discover that I don't know what I'm talking about or they'll discover that I'm not good enough or, or something like this. This is very bad, it never ends well. Um, uh, it's unhealthy for the team, it just leads to this closed dynamic when people aren't talking. It can also be kind of hard to discover because, because someone really, really intensely focusing on what they're doing can kind of look like someone who's also turtling and, and just sort of uh, insulating themselves fr fr from the world. So this can be hard to, to pick up. You can personally encourage habits of openness, uh, but this one can be hard to overcome. And then the worst of all, uh, I'm not actually good enough, therefore I am doomed and will freeze and wait for inevitable failure. This one's the worst of all. Usually this only results from uh, a long period where in insecurities have been channeled into a, uh, into a harmful path and not checked and, and not, a mentor hasn't stepped in to help, help them out. And, and usually at this point it's too late. It, it's hard to turn someone around once they've reached that point. And usually the best thing at that point is to remove their responsibilities and everyone can move on. They can get on with their life, they can start focusing again and on something they enjoy and they're good at. The rest of the team can move on too. So sometimes that's a tough conversation to have and, and sometimes that's the right conversation to have. There are mistakes of inexperience that stem from insecurities. So uh, being too rigid or too flexible is a really common one. It takes experience to know uh, when to hold and when to fold them in a leadership position. And so these are behaviours that, that often come through from inex inexperienced leaders. So too rigid is when they feel like, well, leaders are supposed to be telling things what to do. I, I don't really know what a leader does, so I, I guess I'll tell people what to do. Do this, do that. And they, they feel like they have to project an authoritarian kind of bearing uh, to, to do that. But, but the thought bubbles on the inside are, I'm supposed to know more than everyone else. Now that's wrong. Of course they don't have to know more than everyone else. But if they think that, that's, that's feeding into this behavior. No one will listen to me unless I make a lot of noise. I need to advertise my leaderiness or my prestige will evaporate. So all of this can be helped by good mentoring. And uh, key to that is the realization that it's not your job to know all the answers. Um, 
it's good if you know some of the answers, but really the team success is your success. Uh, uh, a team leader isn't just the person who does everything, it isn't the person who knows everything. It's the person that brings everyone together and brings out the best in their teammates and, and helps move them forward. Use the skills of the team. Now the flip side to that is being too flexible. So this is a certain lack of confidence where they just agree with everything. Um, you know, sure, let's do what you, you want. Sure, okay, that sounds good, let's do, let's do that. Um, and so they'll bend with the wind, they'll bend this way, and then they'll bend that way, and they'll just kind of flow in the breeze without really engaging with the ideas that people are suggesting and just sort of go, going with the flow. Now, now, the real problem with this is that it's a, real, it's a real lack of accountability. Because if they're in a position where they are supposed to own the technical outcomes of the team or the architectural outcomes of, of that team, they're sort of giving up that responsibility here. Someone else has suggested something and they're not engaging with the idea, they're just kind of saying, well, they sound kind of confident, so I, I guess we'll go with that. Uh, I suppose it'll work out. So what's gonna happen if it goes pear-shaped? I mean, what, what are they gonna say? They're probably just gonna say, oh, well, I guess it was that person's idea and they're not gonna take responsibility for it because they didn't engage with it properly in the first place. So this is, kind of sloppy, uh, unaccountable behavior. And it's also really, really common. The, the trap here is that it's every bit as toxic and dysfunctional as some of the other things we've discussed here. But uh, for instance, the, the, the person that was overcompensating by being obnoxious, like, that's obviously toxic. Everyone will look at that and say, well, yeah, that's, that's clearly bad. But this one looks like happy families. This one looks like everyone's getting along. And so this can continue for a long time without getting nipped in the bud. And this can have a really pernicious effect because this can spread. Once other people catch on that they can uh, avoid blowback by making themselves small targets by just kind of agreeing with everything and not actually being accountable for anything or, or sticking to anything, then that can spread. A and it can spread so far that it metastasizes into the whole organization and you have this pervasive culture of a lack of accountability. And at that point, you have a much bigger problem than you can solve with mentoring this or that individual. That, that can be really serious. Montgomery, uh, Todd, Todd Montgomery in his talk earlier pointed out that anything we might wish to achieve in software, uh, accountability is, is the root of that. We need accountability. So this one's really important too. And so what you need to do then is, is as a mentor, is, is to help uh, inculcate that sense of accountability. Well, what is it that you're accountable for? Okay, so someone else had a good idea. That's fine, you can go along with that. But you own the choice of that. You need to engage with the ideas. Let's break it down. What are the pros? What are the cons? What are the risks? And that way, when someone challenges the person on, on, on this choice, they can say, yes, I made this choice for these reasons, uh, with these risks, and, and so forth. So handling insecurities is really ashamed of. There's nothing to be ashamed of as such. But, but it does need to be nipped in the bud. It needs to be handled appropriately. Uh, some people can sort of manage this themselves. A lot of other people need help from mentors. So it's really important for, for mentors to build up those trust bonds to be able to, be able to do that. Um, here's another one, A another skill gap that, that, that you would find in uh, senior developers. Words are actions. Now words don't just convey information. Saying the words is an action and actions have consequences. And the consequences of the action of saying uh, words may be really quite disconnected from the content of those words and may have a moral valence which is also quite independent. Now it sounds kind of obvious saying this out loud but it seems to be widely underappreciated in practice. As developers become more senior, the more important it is to think about words as actions and not just words. Now to take a, an example, um, think about a prime minister with a looming financial crisis. You are not going to see them get in front of a TV, get, get on the TV set and say, well, the economy's booked, go stockpile baked beans and ammunition. <laughs> go for your life, Australia. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And it's not necessarily because they're a filthy liar. It, it's because they have responsibilities. You can't just do that. It might become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Investors pull all their money out of the country. Tens or hundreds of thousands of people uh, lose their jobs and all of a sudden we're one step away from cannibalism. But if they put some lipstick on it and sort of dress it up nicely and don't make too big a deal about it, maybe everyone pulls through. So uh, this doesn't mean that dishonesty is okay. It's not. But it does mean that sometimes there is more to take into account 
than just whether something is true or not and the meaning of the words. Saying it is an action. And all of us are responsible for the consequences of our actions, including saying stuff in front of a particular audience. So let's take a, a juniorish developer uh, saying something that's a little bit confronting and a little bit rude. Your code is bad and you are bad. <laughs> um, now, this might be completely true. The code might be bad, and the, the author of the code may be bad at their job in some respects, but uh, spoken in front of this group, group of people, it, it's also an action that has particular consequences. Firstly, it might signal that, that our dev uh, is not a very pleasant person. Uh, and then to the dev who wrote the code, it's going to make them feel bad. Are they going to start writing good code as a result of that? Is it going to encourage them? Probably not. It doesn't show them how to write better code. Uh, it's probably going to make them more closed and, and less likely to communicate and less willing to share their work. The other developers in the team, it might have one of a number of effects. It might also make them less likely to share their work. Uh, it might make them respect the author of the code less. It might make them respect the dev who said this less. It could do a few uh, things, and none of them are particularly good. But the blast radius is not likely to be that, that, that big, because a manager or someone senior will step in and, and pull that dev aside and say, hey, that's not how we do things here. You go back out there and apologize. And they'll go and apologize, and that'll be that. Everybody will get on with, with their life. Now, if a very, very senior tech lead says that same thing, well, the words are the same, but the action this time is a tactical nuclear weapon with rippling waves of toxicity coming out from the center. The action that is being performed is entirely different because of uh, the seniority and influence of that person. So this time, the action entails also, uh, again, it sort of signals that maybe they're a bit of a disagreeable person, but it also signals this is how leaders behave. If you want to be a leader, you should behave like this. If you stick your neck out, this will happen to you. It entails a big loss of face for the dev who wrote the code. And others will say, well, this is an example, and I don't want to have this big loss of face myself, and I will change my behavior to, to, to not have a big loss of face as well. This is going to have a big, rippling, bad effect on the team. The, the teamwork will start to break down. Resentment will build up. Um, the walls will start to go up. Teammates are less likely to speak to each other. They're less likely to be open about their work. Personal safety breaks down and the wheels start falling off. This team is an effective functioning unit. Now, our tech lead might protest now. Well, they're the exact same words as, as the other developer said. I'm just calling it like I see it. I mean, what this very senior person is missing is that words are actions and they are responsible for the consequences of their actions, including saying stuff to a group of people. So that the higher your personal prestige, the more consequential your words become. The wider the audience to whom you are speaking these words, then the more consequential uh, that the consequences of this action becomes. And it doesn't necessarily just increase the magnitude. It might flip consequences that are mostly good on balance to consequences that are mostly bad on balance. For some very, very senior leaders like executives, they may be completely incapable of saying anything without having these giant rippling consequences. So, so uh, if a CEO says something, uh, it might not just ripple around and reverberate around the company, it might ripple out into the stock market and into the, uh, you know, out into the business world or out into these giant market segments of hundreds of thousands of mums and dads deciding what to do with their money. The consequences can be really big. So, so consider uh, the, the, the public speeches that you see CEOs give, like, like your own CEO. They, they're usually really boring. They're usually very, very bland motherhood statements, nothing too disturbing, just sort of gentle rolling waves. And this is not necessarily because they're boring people. It's because they understand that words are actions, and every single thing they say is a big action that might have big, rippling consequences. Now, if you've been in a private conversation with an executive, now that's a different kettle of fish. <laughs> they're, very, they're usually very frank, very direct. The language can get very, very colorful. They, they, uh, they know what they want. They don't like bullshit. They don't like excuses. And they don't have a lot of time. Uh, and these two different modes of communication are not because they're two-faced. It's because they understand that words are actions, that the, the action of saying something in a private context is a totally different action to, to that of, of uh, saying it in a public context. So to achieve 
consequences that are smaller than these giant seismic waves, they might have to work through other people, get someone else to say something, um, try and influence through indirect means uh, without saying public things. Now, now for an emerging tech leader, uh, this kind of stuff can change in real time. The, the mapping of the words that you say to the consequences that flow from that in January might be different fr from uh, June. It might change in the space of a few months as their prestige, as their reputation grows. This can be really, really confusing and frustrating for a lot of people. Something that worked in a local context with a group of known people might offend a bunch of people and be counterproductive when um, said to a larger group of people or with uh, a particular reputation. So mentors can have a role in helping them bridge this gap because it's really hard to navigate this kind of uh, shifting balance of what you say and the consequences of it in real time. It's really important to create opportunities uh, inside companies for, for emerging tech leaders. Uh, and so this often sort of is clustered around teams and projects. Teams and projects are very dynamic, short-lived things with particular leadership requirements um, with, with limited scope. Um, however, organizational roles are these very, very slow-moving, rigid things tied to salary and, and titles and, and things like this. They're very hard to change because uh, the, the head of HR sort of owns them for a whole bunch of hard-to-change reasons, and they're very difficult to influence from, from, from below. So, so one thing uh, you can do at a company is to create informal org structure. We're saying, well, okay, well, let's just say there's tech leads for these teams or, or, or in these projects, and whoever we nominate as the tech lead has these responsibilities, and away we go. This gives someone an opportunity to start developing these extra skills in a controlled environment, in a relatively safe environment for, for some limited amount of time. And it doesn't require getting buy-in um, from the head of HR. At MIB, we've tried to do this in um, a few of our, our divisions. Uh, where we've had a number of crews and, and we've asked the, the managers of each crew to nominate a tech lead and then we form a tech lead group from that. They're still fundamentally involved in their crew doing their crew's work, but then they also form part of this cohesive group of leaders who are responsible for coming to decisions and uh, helping resolve technical, um, uh, technical issues of common interest and to help drive patterns and practices. And so this has been really successful. Um, the, the aims are to reduce the decision-making workload for the architects, increasing the architect visibility into teams so they don't drift off into ivory tower land, um, increasing teams' access to fast uh, advice and decisions, and of course, to grow the new tech leaders. And so far, we've found this to be a really, really successful way of doing that. However, uh, it hasn't been all roses. There's been a lot of confusion around the scope of responsibility. It's important to be really, really precise around what the responsibilities are. Do, do they make decisions? Are they allowed to just come to decisions on behalf of the team? Do they tell the team what to do? Or, or you know, what are they supposed to do? This has been a source of confusion in, in the way that we've done it. Uh, it can be hard to balance teamwork with, with the technical lead work. There's no more hours in the day for, for coming up with initiatives like this. So um, what I want to leave you with here is that there's a whole bunch of situational pros and cons to the different ways you can slice this, but it's a thing you can do. There is a whole bunch of different ways you can create temporary informal organizational structure to help give people opportunities. So in conclusion, growing tech leaders in-house is a really good thing. Bridging the non-technical gaps is really hard, and that's... Uh, the major challenge there, uh, and that includes building a wider perspective, building trust and relationships, managing insecurities appropriately, understanding words as actions, and good mentoring can make a world of difference. One-on-one -on -one coaching, setting a good example, um, timely interventions, and then creating uh, opportunities with informal org structure. All of these things can help. Thank you for your time.